Let's talk about China's belt For a decade, and road the country's okay. ambitious belt Tracks and road. are emerging in China's belt the and road is initiative. You, they see a lot of false narratives. The BRI is a The BRI projects are literally falling apart. President Xi Jinping is on the brink of colossal defeat. The once unshakable monarch has begun to show chinks in his armor and all that hails from a project of his own making the Belt and Road Initiative. Once hailed as the future of China and the world, the BRI project is slowly just fading into the shadows of its former self, dragging Beijing and Xi Jinping down with it. With debt mounting high and Chinese foreign policy going into the gutter, it seems that the BRI project can properly be debated on whether it is truly a failure or if these are setbacks that can be overcome. The jury, however, favors the former. In this video, I will explore why the BRI is failing, the main reason for it, and also see if there is yet a way that Xi Jinping can salvage what was supposed to be the flagship project of his reign in office. For longtime viewers of the channel, you'll know that I made a video about the BRI some time ago, explaining what it is and what it has the potential to do. For the new viewers, firstly, thank you for joining me, and please feel free to drop a quick hello in the comment section. For your benefit, let me briefly explain what this Belt and Road Initiative is all about. The BRI, as it's often called, is an ambitious plan spearheaded by China's President Xi Jinping to develop new trade routes connecting China with the rest of the world. It has often been dubbed as the New Silk Road, with the expectation that much like the ancient Chinese Silk Road, it will facilitate trade routes that will see a movement of goods and culture, with China being the central point of it all. By developing infrastructure in various countries, China aims to create an interconnected system of smooth global trade under Beijing's rule and guidelines. This sentence ushers us into the second reason why the BRI exists, to bring things under Beijing's watchful eye. China has long sought to become the new global presence ahead of the US, and the BRI has been a ripe opportunity for that. Through this initiative, the BRI can develop an expanded, interdependent market for China, grow China's economic and political power, and create the right conditions for China to build a high-technology economy. The best way to put this is soft power. China aims to and is building its soft power through this project, as it slowly becomes the more dominant force in the world. The sheer magnitude and financing behind this project which covers over 150 countries with over a $1 trillion budget, had Chinese President Xi Jinping bragging, calling it the project of the century, a project that would restructure the global world order. Such bold statements, however, have ceased. And now all we have are questions about whether the project is a complete failure at all. The question is, what went so wrong so quickly? Quick side note, the BRI might be failing, but that doesn't mean you should also fail to press the like button in support of the channel. It's a joy making these videos for you, and your support to push them to others with the algorithm means a lot. Okay, back to the basics. One thing is very clear. China's BRI seems to have fallen very short of its original goals. What it was intended to be is not what it is today. And the question is, why? What happened? Two words can answer that pretty quickly. The first is COVID, and the second one is debt. To understand these two words in context, you'll need to understand how China ran the BRI. As grand as it is, the BRI has always been criticized by the West as a debt trapping scheme. This is because of the gangster-like way that Beijing runs it. When the project launched in 2013, Beijing would approach poorer countries in Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, and the periphery of Europe, and offer loans. These loans were meant to be used towards important infrastructure projects, ports, rail links, dams, roads, and the like. This is because, through the development of such infrastructure, the network of the BRI would grow, facilitating easier movement of goods and resources. Well, at least on paper. In providing these loans, state-owned Chinese banks would arrange the financing, and Chinese contractors would execute the projects and manage them after completion. That was one of the conditions of the loan. Chinese suppliers and contractors were always given the groundwork tenders to increase Chinese benefits. Unlike loans that are offered by the West, 
Chinese money does not discriminate against the nation or have as harsh of demands as the Western loans carry. The Chinese offered very easygoing loans that would get back their pound of flesh through exorbitant interest rates. The gangster part of Beijing would truly show if the host country failed to pay, where the Chinese would simply then take the project and bring it under Chinese ownership. In that way, China would own major assets on foreign soil. Because of the kinds of countries that China targeted, remember the poorer nations of various continents, China was in no shortage of takers. Due to this, Beijing gained influence and considerable leverage over the nations that allowed themselves to become involved. As a matter of fact, since it was launched, China has spent over a trillion dollars in loans shared with over 150 countries. That's huge. That alone makes China the world's largest official creditor. But you know what Uncle Ben in Spider-Man said, with great power comes great responsibility or in this case, a great many problems. To begin with, China's loan-giving program was based on the fact that China didn't ask too many questions or impose restrictions. This helped them get more countries on board in a short amount of time, and yet at the same time, it provided little to no oversight on the funds dispensed. What do you get when you combine corrupt third-world country officials and billions of dollars of unsupervised finances? Bingo you get corruption. Much of the finances that China sent out, instead of being used for economic purposes, ended up being diverted to political causes. For the funds that did go to economic purposes, the motivations themselves were dubious and questionable. Many countries embarked on projects for facilities that wouldn't be financially viable, all in the name of development. <coughs> I'm looking at you, Sri Lanka, and your Hambantota port. Before the pandemic hit, this very questionable system worked somewhat okay because the poor nations always found a way to pay back the Chinese interest loans in installments. This was because they would simply take the money from elsewhere and pay back the Chinese. It was a stealing from Peter to pay Paul kind of thing. However, when COVID struck, everything changed. As economies closed down and global finances ground to a halt, many of the countries involved in the BRI project started to find it hard to pay their loans back. 2020, a year and nine months ago, give or take a few days, when the word pandemic essentially took over our lives. The coronavirus pandemic has tanked the global economy with unprecedented speed. Millions out of work, markets plunging, business slammed to a screeching halt. With no income coming in, there was no income to pay out, and hence several nations started to default. On top of that, with several nations struggling, there was now a reduced interest in the BRI. It's hard to think of building bridges and the like when people are, you know, starving to death. By the time COVID came and went, the BRI had been reduced to shambles. Countries that had taken loans were behind on payments. Interest in the project was reduced, and each of these countries, including China, was a little bit too busy cleaning up after their domestic affairs. When the time came to finally take stock, it was a story of debt, debt, and more debt. Between the pandemic and everything that's happened since, including the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, something that always seems to make its way into my videos, several countries that were key partners of the BRI, like Pakistan and Sri Lanka, now face unimaginable debt distress. This is because of high oil and food prices and the collapse in the tax base during the pandemic. The pandemic might be over, but its effects will take years to fade. Speaking of Pakistan, it is so deep in debt that the nation engaged in the International Monetary Fund for relief aid because it simply can't afford to pay its debt to the Chinese. China has been placed in what appears to be an impossible position. The reckless nature of the BRI loans has caught up to them, with the World Bank estimating that over 60% of all BRI loans involve countries in financial distress. This is a drastic jump from the less than 5% figure that Beijing's overseas lending portfolio had in borrower countries in distress back in 2010. In just over a decade, they have increased by 55%. That is a wild statistic. What this means in the context of this discussion is that most of these countries are unable to pay back these loans, having mismanaged their funds. The borrower countries themselves can see the disaster they are in. 
Bangladesh Finance Minister A.H.M. Mustafa Kemal has publicly blamed economically unviable Chinese BRI projects for exacerbating the economic crisis in Sri Lanka. He says that developing countries must think twice about taking more loans through the BRI, as global inflation and slowing growth add to the strains on indebted emerging markets. To add substance to the minister's words, Bangladesh has made it clear that they will not accept any further loans, but only grants from Beijing. Nepal has also taken the same stance. It seems that many nations are starting to wake up to the reality of the foolishness of these loans. But could it be a little too late? China understands the precarious nature of its position, and the nation has tried to counter this disaster as best as its rigid policies can allow. In recent years, it has responded to the rising tide of debt distress by pivoting away from infrastructure project lending and ramping up liquidity support operations. This is evidenced by the fact that nearly 80% of its emergency rescue lending was issued between 2016 and 2021. To even get here, Beijing has been resistant to accept how the whole situation is unraveling before them. Given that the BRI is Xi Jinping's flagship project, it's easy to understand the hesitancy that comes with accepting the failure of a project at this level. This can even be seen in the way that loans are referred to, as Chinese officials put bankers under pressure to avoid any reference to bad or failed loans. As bad as the situation is for the BRI partners, there are actions that China still will not take. Beijing has stood 10 toes down to the fact that it does not offer bailouts to all BRI borrowers in distress. The poorest of its partners, the low-income countries, are typically offered a debt restructuring deal that involves a grace period or final repayment date extension, but no new money. China can't keep giving loans to those who already look incapable of paying, and so grace periods are all they have. For middle-income countries, Beijing tends to give new money via what they call balance of payments support to avoid or delay default. But even this is not cheap or free. As with all Chinese loans, they are much more expensive. Borrowing from Beijing in emergencies carries a 5% interest rate, whereas an IMF loan, for example, carries a 2% interest rate, less than half of what the Chinese demand. China has also adamantly refused to cooperate with Western efforts through the G20's Paris Club, a group of nations that serves to restructure debt when a country is unable to pay. China's refusal to come to the table likely stems partially from a lack of desire to admit that it has nations defaulting on it, and also in their own self-interest. They could probably pressure these struggling countries so that they get repaid on their own terms, and first, too. This is opposed to coming together with several nations and having to stand in line. So, what do we have left when it's all said and done? We have a BRI project whose programs have almost come to a halt, we have partnering countries if the BRI is in massive debt and unable to pay back what they have borrowed. For those that can pay, we have several of them vowing to never take Chinese loans again. And lastly, we have a rigid and adamant China that is still investing in the BRI while trying to do damage control. It's hard to not outright conclude that China's Belt and Road Initiative has failed, but as with all things global and economic, only time will truly tell. But BRI isn't the only way the CCP has sought to increase its influence on other nations. In Myanmar, China has supported the new military regime and hopes to increase its influence over the country. You can click the video on the screen to learn more about how China is taking over Myanmar.